Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Z. I'm a clinical psychologist specializing in transgender care. Welcome to my channel. If you are new or regular viewer but have not yet subscribed, I would really appreciate if you do subscribe. It helps me with my channel and it also helps others find the content. If you don't yet follow me on Instagram, link is below. Please do also follow me on Instagram so that way we can connect as well. Having said that, for today's video, I am going to try to describe what does dysphoria feel like? A lot of people ask me this question because I think a lot of people want to uh, pinpoint uh, whether what they're experiencing is uh, truly gender dysphoria. And but I, it, it's, you know, in reality, it's not that black and white. Um, in reality, it's it's not a matter of just checking off boxes. A lot of things going into figuring out if you do have gender dysphoria. So I'm going to try my best to share with you over the years uh, how I came to understand the presentation of gender dysphoria. What does it feel like? We're going to tap into feelings specifically uh, from my 20 years working with individuals and people describing and sharing that uh, with me. And I'm going to break it down into severe gender dysphoria, uh, moderate gender dysphoria, and very mild to almost non-existent gender dysphoria, because all of those also carry a set of feelings. So to start off, let's talk about severe gender dysphoria. What does it feel like if individual feels severe gender dysphoria? This one is by far perhaps uh, the easiest one to describe, to pinpoint, and probably the one where... Uh, if some of the things resonate, there is a very high probability that you do have gender dysphoria. And that is why it's the easiest one to pinpoint because the severity is so high. For starters, a very severe gender dysphoria, and by the way, we're talking about gender dysphoria that has a root issue uh, stemming from gender identity. Um, gender dysphoria for individuals who feel it severe are going to have a very visceral uh, feeling. It's going to be a very present, a very, uh, like when you have a toothache, you really feel it. You know you have a toothache. When you have a migraine, you feel it. You know you have migraine. Severe dysphoria. For all of you watching who struggle with severe dysphoria, my heart goes out to all of you because it is like that and you know it. It's a goddamn nagging painful feeling. And the feeling revolves around viscerally, strongly around physicality. Uh, severe dysphoria is very much triggered first and foremost by physical gender dysphoria. For that reason, it's very anchored and very tied to the body. You may feel very strong a disconnection with your body. You may feel very strong. And the reason why I feel disconnection is because you don't relate, you don't feel uh, comfortable, you don't feel congruent with the way your body is being gendered. You may wake up every single day and feel as if you are wearing a bodysuit, literally. You feel like you're wearing a mask. You feel like you are, uh, you know, the dogmatic old way, trapped in the wrong body. Well, that definitely can apply to some individuals who have severe dysphoria. You can literally feel like you are trapped. Your soul, your spirit, your authenticity is trapped in a body that doesn't resonate with you. So there's going to be a very visceral, first and foremost, relationship to uh, the physical realm. Uh, it may be not an overall whole body. It could be an element of uh, physical attributes. It could be that uh, when you look down at your hands, your hands give you a very strong gender dysphoria. It could be that when you, every time you use the bathroom and you have to um, see or touch your genitals, that gives you dysphoria. It could be when you speak the voice. It could be when you look at yourself in the mirror. It could be when you look at yourself in the mirror every day you're shaving. It could be when you look at yourself in the mirror every day you're brushing your hair. It's just that strong visceral sense. Like I said, very akin to you have a toothache, you have a migraine. You just know. You feel it. You feel it. The pain, the tension, the incongruency is there. And you just know. You know. You don't know how you know. But deep down, you just know that your gender right now, the gender that you were assigned, is not the gender you're comfortable with. 
You just feel it. You maybe have felt it all of your life. You maybe have always felt like a sense of not belonging it. But there is this very strong presence. People who have severe gender dysphoria seldom, in my experience, uh, actually wonder, is this gender dysphoria? They just kind of know. Um, like I said, akin to toothache. You can't disregard it. You can't dismiss it. Your mind can just say, maybe you're making this up. Uh, it's very difficult for you to find rationalizations, justifications around it. Just like if you have a toothache, it's very hard to start telling yourself you're delusional. You, It's really not pain that you feel. It's Your tooth is not really aching. You're imagining this. Same thing with severe dysphoria. It's very, very present. Um I see severe gender dysphoria much more rare. I see moderate gender dysphoria and mild much more common. And I think part of the reason why it's less rare is because today uh, we have so many things that it can help in some shape or form uh, at least ease up the tension of it. And I think that helps tremendously. But the feelings, the first feeling of the first one, the severe one, is it's very difficult to disregard, very difficult. I have yet to see a client that um, is in denial of the severity uh, being so severe. I have yet to see a client that comes to me and describes severe gender dysphoria and yet uh, completely unaware that it is gender dysphoria. Like I said, most of you who are, and my heart does goes all of you because it is so, so painful, um, are going to be very aware of it. Uh, this is why for individuals who struggle with severe gender dysphoria, it is so frustrating, very frustrating, when you see individuals who are struggling with much milder, almost non-existent gender dysphoria, and who don't step into gender-affirming treatments, who maybe just, you know, feel like they can gender bend now and then, which very might feel very frustrating because you have no way of understanding that. For you, it's either you do something about it or you don't. Um, it's it's sad. It really comes down to um, to surviving, really, and it is incredibly difficult. If people who have severe gender dysphoria and feel it will go to very extreme coping ways in order to alleviate it, and that will include drinking, lots of drinking, addictions may be very present uh, in their lives, uh, maybe other type of substances, uh, escapism, overworking themselves to death, uh, very, very negative coping strategies are going to be employed uh, because, because they feel like they need to alleviate it. So that's a severe one. So again, severe one is, is it's, you, cannot, you cannot not know. It's so present in your life. The second one, the moderate one, is now we're stepping in the territory where if you feel moderate level of gender dysphoria, that's the one where people still think maybe something else is going. That's the one that is a little bit more, I would say, foggier, right? A little bit more, maybe you feel like something is aching, but it's not exactly toothache and it's not really exactly a migraine, but something is off. The best way is that people tend to describe it is this feeling of you internally starting to pick up and feel that something is really off. You're starting to pick up that this is not just um, an interest. It's not just maybe uh, if you engage in feminizing or masculinizing, it's not just something that you're gender bending here. You're starting to feel that it goes beyond gender bending. And one of the reasons why you're starting to feel that it goes beyond gender bending is because of people who are in a moderate gender dysphoria camp, uh, gender dysphoria tends to fluctuate a lot. The severe gender dysphoria camp tends to be, it's almost like ongoing pain of gender dysphoria, right? And only when you sip into uh, very negative coping, it may temporarily quieten down. The moderate gender dysphoria is something that spikes up and goes away. It, it's the one that fluctuates the most. The reason why it fluctuates the most is a multitude of reasons. One of the primary reasons is because there's still a lot of unawareness going on, um, but also because perhaps you are doing a lot of coping and maybe even a lot of healthy coping to help, uh, help, uh, cope with gender dysphoria. And as a result, 
um, it it spikes up and down, and it's not always like a flat line, right? So because it fluctuates and because some days it really hits you, this feeling of unease, suddenly you went from feeling of unease to like, oh, I'm really feeling incongruency here. And then the next day you wake up and you're you're thinking, kind of comfortable in my gender. So you oscillate between, I feel unease. I can't put my finger on it, but something is there. Two, I don't think anything's there. This oscillation, this feeling of oscillation is what's making a lot of people feel stuck because then you keep going back and forth and then you start questioning whether what you have is gender dysphoria. Once in a while, you may have the severities that severe individuals in severe can feel. Once in a while, it might hit you. Uh, oftentimes, maybe in a moments when... Um, you really have to confront your body. Maybe it is during intimacy. Maybe it is during sexual encounter, for example, that suddenly it hits you and you're dissociating and you have visceral awareness that you're not comfortable with your gender. But then the next day, again, it fluctuates and it may go away and you start wondering maybe it never was there. So the individuals who, for him, it is mild, it's kind of more mild. You will describe it, at least people will describe it in this way, um, there's sometimes, sometimes I feel uncomfortable with my, you name it, uh, genitals, my facial hair, my my physique, my voice, uh, my my some aspects of my gender, some aspects of secondary and primary sex characteristics, and sometimes I feel fine. Sometimes it bothers me. Sometimes it doesn't bother me. Sometimes I feel like I can feel something and I can't put my finger on it. This is the best way to describe actually how people feel when there are in moderate camp is that you can't put your finger on it. And the reason, again, why you can't put your finger on it is because of fluctuations. Because sometimes you feel like something is there and then sometimes you don't. And this um, something is there, something is not there is what gives you a ton of confusion, a ton of uncertainty. The moderate camp, um, and, and I say this, Look, I say this with all of the heart for all of you. People who are in a camp of feeling dysphoria very severely, I will say that in the very least, you know. You are less likely to be in a questioning phase. You know you have gender dysphoria. You know you're not comfortable with your gender. If you're stuck, it's not because you don't know. If you are stuck, it's because you know but are afraid to take steps. You know, and you're not ready to take steps. You know, and uh, you may have all these other things revolving around. Uh, maybe you're catastrophizing. Maybe you think it's never going to work out, but you know, you just know. And individuals who are here, who are in moderate camp, you're even even more difficult position because even though you may not feel such pain, right? But what makes it a much more difficult position is because the uncertainty is driving you nuts. Here, people know they have a toothache and they know the solution is go see a dentist. Uh, and maybe what's stopping them to go see a dentist, again, I'm using this as a metaphor, albeit a very reductionistic one, what's stopping people from going to see a dentist is that maybe they don't, can't afford it. Maybe if they were to pay for it, they're taking money away from their family. Maybe uh, they're afraid and terrified um, of um, dentists in general. <laughs> you get the point. People in a moderate camp are um, having a hard time making any steps because you're not feeling that severity, so the uncertainty is really, really high. When uncertainty is really, really high, um, that can really breed all sorts of things, anxiety, depression, rumination. People who are already prone to anxiety, my goodness, my heart goes out to you because that uncertainty is going to drive you freaking nuts. That's when people go down the rabbit hole of internet, of searching, searching, looking for solution. And the minute you feel like you found solution, guess what happens to you? The next day you wake up and you don't feel this for you. And then you tell yourself, oh, the solution I found doesn't apply to me because I feel fine today. I can live in my gender. And that lack of absence of dysphoria may last for you, last for a week. It can even last for whole months until it spikes up again. And then you go, oh, wait a second. Shit, this feeling is here again. So it's this, um, again, it's your feeling 
The primary difference is that you're feeling something is off. You can't exactly put the finger on it. But you're starting, the longer you've been living with this feeling of something is off, the longer you're starting to actually put a finger on it. And the reason why is because it's been so consistent. Uh, even though there's still days when you wake up and you feel okay about your assigned gender, uh, because historically you've been dragging this uncertainty for so long, you're also realizing that that's also not uh, um, not enough of information to presume that you're totally fine. So that's the middle camp. The last camp is uh, probably the most challenging one to uh, clarify for people that they have gender dysphoria and the most challenging one for clinicians to, to, um, to figure out what's going on. And that's the camp of... Um, very mild to non-existent gender dysphoria. The first, let me rephrase quickly, the, the people in the severity camp, that's the most easiest one for clinician to diagnose. Um, that's that's the most easiest one to spot. The people who are in the middle camp, it for some clinicians who are not very experienced, it still can be tricky, and then they can take you down the rabbit hole of wasting also your time because now they're themselves, because they're not trained well enough, they're dancing around with you through this fluctuation, and they're dancing, they get colluded and enmeshed with your uncertainty, and they become uncertain about your experience as well. The last camp is the most challenging one. And I spoke about it in a video. I don't remember the name of it. Um, I just spoke about it recently. That's a camp where most likely if you feel mild to neutral, neutral meaning this, you narrative, you feeling about gender dysphoria. And it is gender dysphoria, but people just don't call it gender dysphoria because they expect it to be severe. The narrative is often goes along the lines of, um, I don't... Uh, I don't love my assigned gender. I don't hate my assigned gender. I don't love my uh, physical body, but I also don't hate it. I feel neutral about it. So there's going to be this element of neutrality about it. At the same time, people also feel in this neutrality camp that something is off. And the reason why they're feeling that something is off is because they're starting to wake up from either gender denial or gender depression. And it's gender denial and gender depression that is keeping people in a neutral camp. It's very hard to impossible, in my experience, for gender denial and depression to keep people with severe gender dysphoria in denial or in depression because, again, it's very visceral. They feel it almost daily. And because it's so visceral, again, you can't just uh, pretend that your toothache is a delusion. You can't just tell your you know, be in denial of your toothache. You can't just repress the feelings of toothache. You feel it. People in this uh, middle camp can still sometimes experience and do gender denial, less likely gender repression. People in the camp of neutrality are more likely to experience both gender denial and gender depression. And that's the one that's very, very tricky. Again, the feeling is going to be mm, neutral. And yet, I'm going to add and yet, because here's the thing. People, some people do genu uh, genuinely do feel neutral about their bodies and neutral about their genders. It doesn't mean necessarily people have gender dysphoria. The tricky part is you feel neutral and yet here's the very common feeling. Remember how I said the middle camp, the mother gender dysphoria is the most common feeling is that they feel like something is off, but they can't put the finger on it. The neutrality people in, in neutral camp are the ones who feel like I have an itch to scratch, but I don't know what it is. Something is nagging. You, you're feeling something, but you don't exactly know what it is. But you are realizing it has to do something with gender. Um, otherwise, uh, like I said, lots of people feel neutrality about their gender and about their bodies and about, you know, not everybody's very in sync and in touch and connected to their bodies and their primary, secondary sex. Some people really don't give a shit. They're more uh, connected to their spiritual realm or they're connected to other aspects of their sense of self. But these people, I want to be very clear here, these people don't feel like they have an itch to scratch. They're comfortable with their neutrality, in other words. People who, for whom neutrality is manifesting as gender dysphoria is very mild, almost non-existent gender dysphoria, are individuals who are waking up from their denial and their repression. They're starting to unravel 
the wool of their sweater. And the reason why um, uh, it's unraveling is because they're waking up from their gender denial or depression. Now, a lot of things can wake people up from their gender denial and depression. Uh, seeing something, uh, seeing particular content, uh, a memory reawakened, certain things. And that's when you suddenly feel like you have an itch to scratch, but you don't know exactly what it is, but you're wondering what it is. Again, people who are, um, nothing is unraveling for them, may feel neutral and they just live their lives. But Again, the reason why people come and see me and they're trying to figure out what's going on, something led them, right? So something has taken you, if you're in this neutral, something is taking you, even if you're watching this right now, something is taking you from I feel neutral to I wonder if this is gender dysphoria, I wonder if I'm transgender, to start watching content. So what is that something that is taking you from neutrality to wonder even if you're transgender? And oftentimes that something for a lot of people is unraveling of the core gender identity that is staying uh, dormant because of denial and because of depression. So to summarize, three camps of gender dysphoria. First one is severe gender dysphoria. People feel very visceral, physical sense akin to, I have a toothache, I know I have a toothache. People who struggle with severe gender dysphoria, my God, are very, very aware they have gender dysphoria. People in the middle camp are uh, who have moderate presentation of gender dysphoria, which often feels like I can't quite put my finger on it. I can feel something is off. I can't put my finger on it. Um, and one of the reasons why you can't put your finger on it is because you're oscillating. Your dysphoria tends to fluctuate, and one day you don't have it, another you do, and it keeps you perpetually confused and uncertain. People who are in a neutral, mild camp your narrative is most likely going to be, I feel neutral about my body. I don't hate it. I don't love it. I feel neutral. But something is starting to unravel that is starting to make you question uh, aspects and your relationship to your gender. And oftentimes, people who experience a lot of denial and depression are going to be in this camp. So this is what oftentimes how gender dysphoria feels. And within those little snippets that I just gave you, there's going to be even more individualized narrative and stories of how it's going to feel particularly to you because you are your own uh, unique individual. You have your own set of experience. You have your own set of coping style. You have your own set of coping uh, support systems uh, surrounding you. Uh, for that reason, somebody who is very severe, it could be so severe where you're going to tell me that I can't even get out of bed. Somebody else with severe is going to tell me I can't get out of bed and I can also go to work. But when I come home, I have to crumble down. I have to have five glasses of red wine just to pull myself back together. So it's, um, the narratives around the feelings are going to be then person-centric to all of you. Comment below, let me know which one do you feel like you're falling into, um, how you're feeling it, how you're experiencing it, uh, how you're coping. Uh, comment below, let me know, and I will see you all next time. Goodbye.